And I'm going to start off by reading from the book of Esther. Esther 4 from verse 13. Esther chapter 4 from verse 13. And it reads, And Mordecai told them to answer to Esther, Do not think in your hearts you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? The title of my message this morning is designed for influence. I like what Mordecai says to Esther. He makes it clear to Esther that unless you do something, unless you rise up for the deliverance of the Jews, you too will perish. He reminds Esther that do not get too comfortable in the palace of the king. Do not get too comfortable as the queen because your destiny could be for such a time as this. You've been called. Is it not that you've been probably called for such a time as this? So as we go through understanding what it means as leaders to be designed for influence, what it means as leaders to be designed for impact, what it means as leaders to be designed as those who will make a difference in the kingdom of God, the intent of this message this morning is basically to address three leadership challenges that we often face. And the first challenge we are going to be addressing in this message is that leaders who are not cognizant of the fact that they're designed for influence are likely to live outside their God-ordained purpose. So basically what I'm saying is that if you don't understand your purpose in the kingdom of God, if you don't understand what God has designed you for, what God has called you to, you will probably, you're most likely going to live outside your purpose. Or even if you live within your purpose, you might not live to the fullness of that purpose. So it is important that we understand what it is that we call to. We understand our purpose in the kingdom of God. So so that as effective leaders, we can live within the designs of God's ordained purpose. The second challenge we're going to be looking at is that leaders who are unaware that they are designed for influence more often than not are probably confused about their assigned inf territory of influence and that can be problematic in the kingdom of God. So it's one thing to know what your purpose is. It's one thing to know what you are called to. The next question you'd need to understand or ask yourself is, what is your assigned territory of influence? What is your sphere of influence? Where are you called to impact? Because we're not all called to impact in the same in the same place. For some of you, you called to the fivefold. Maybe you called to be an apostle. Maybe you called to be an evangelist. Maybe you called to be a prophet, a pastor, a teacher. For others, maybe you called to impact out there in the different domains. Could it be that you are called to impact in education, in the sphere of education, in the sphere of business, in agriculture? Could it be that you called to impact in in a in, in, in health, science and technology? Could it be that you called to impact in, in the legal fraternity, in the arts, in media, in family? I don't know what your domain is, but it is important that if you are going to fulfill the fullness of God's purpose in your life, if you are going to be the kind of leader who's designed for influence, it is imperative that you, des you understand what it means, what territory you called to impact in. The third challenge we're going to be looking at is leaders who are not mindful of the revelation that they are designed for influence are more inclined to miss opportunities to cultivate the character, the attributes, the partnerships, the alliances that are requisite to achieve the purposes of God. 
So number one, we need to understand the, our purpose in God, our purpose in the kingdom. Then we need to understand our assigned territory, our area of influence. Thirdly, we need to understand what it is that it's going to take to actually achieve that particular purpose. This is in terms of character. This is in terms of the necessary attributes that you will need to achieve the purposes of God for your life. And in other cases, it's even in terms of the partnerships. It's even in terms of the alliances that are necessary for you to achieve the purposes of God. So we're going to be unpacking those three challenges of leadership. Now my question to you this morning before I continue is are you the kind of leader who's convinced that you are designed for influence, that you are designed to make an impact, that you are designed to make a difference? My next question to you is do you understand your God-given purpose? And I want to encourage you, if you are not sure of what God has called you to, it is important that you take time to actually be in the presence of God and ask him what his purpose for your life is. My next question to you is, do you comprehend that you... The, the, do you comprehend the territory or the inf sphere of influence within which God's assigned purpose is to be executed? And thirdly, do you recognize and appreciate the qualities, the traits that would be essential to effectively fulfill that influence? And unless we understand those three things, we will not be people who are effective in, our, in the kingdom of God. I like what it says in Esther 4 verse 14, the B part. Yet who knows whether you have called, you've, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. It is also important for us, before we continue, to understand the background to the story of Esther. And the setting here is in the, it, it, it's the setting is the, in the story here is in, the setting of the story is in, ba in Babylon. And at this time, Jews the Jews that lived in Babylon were basically under the, the rule of the, page, the Persian king. But what had happened is that they had been free to actually return to Jerusalem at this time for about 50 years now. But some of them chose not to return to Jerusalem. So there was a community within the Persian community that, decide, that resided in Babylon. And at this time, the king who ruled, the Persian king who ruled was a guy was a king called Ahasuerus. And what had happened here was he had given an order to his wife Vashti, Queen Vashti, to basically appear at a dinner that he had, he was going to host, at a banquet that he was going to host. But what she did was she defied the king's order and was subsequently demoted. That's the background here. And when we look at the, we pick, pick up the story from Esther 2, it says, Esther 2 verse 1, after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, what had been decreed against him. Then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king and let the king appoint officers in the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins of Shashan the citadel into the women's quarters under the custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women. And let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king and he did so. We skip to verse 7 and it says, And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for he had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard and when many young women were gathered at the citadel under the custody of Hegai, Esther was also taken into the king's palace into the care of Hegai, the custodian of the women. What I'd like us to do is to basically look at the qualities of leaders that are designed for influence. And the first quality we are going to look at is that 
they move, number one, they move from trauma to triumph. They move from trauma to triumph. And it is interesting here that we given a bit about the background of Esther. What we learn in this particular passage of scripture is that Esther, she was an orphan. Esther was not a, 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 an influential person. She was actually, she had been adopted by Mordecai and was being raised and cared for by, the, by her cousin Mordecai. And I want to ask you, have you ever been in that place, maybe where you face traumatic circumstances in your life? Maybe you look at your life and you say there's nothing in your life that really means a lot. There's nothing in your life that can cause you to move in the fullness of God's purposes for your life. Maybe you grew up in a poor background, within a poor background. Maybe you grew up being ridiculed. Maybe you, you grew up being a victim of injustice and pain. Maybe you grew up maybe with, with the, the, the kind of qualities and traits that are not befitting for a purpose for a person who's designed for God's purpose. I don't know what your circumstances have been, but I know that not all of us have got pretty stories. We all have some kind of a background that is not attractive. But here, we presented with the story of a woman who was in that particular situation, nothing to call for her background, nothing to be, that, ha that would basically make her a person of influence. Do you feel that you carry maybe some baggage in your past that will not allow you or will not propel you to move into the purposes of God? Do you feel like your, the, your reputation is not good enough for you to impact in the kingdom of God? But this morning I want to encourage you that leaders who are called or designed for influence are those who recognize that God is not limited by the things that limit us. So we look at ourselves, we see our defects, we look at ourselves, we see our inabilities, we look at ourselves, we see the things that cripple us, but those things do not matter in the eyes of God. The very things that limit us are not the things that limit God. Because what God has done is he's gone ahead of us, he's seen our future, he's been there, and what he does is he works from our future back to the present day so that he can fulfill, he can shape, he can mold, he can engineer the purpose, his purpose for your for your life so he's not limited by our limited he's not limited by the things that limited us that limit us he's not limited by our past failures he's not even limited by our lack of resources or our poor upbringing I want us to, to be encouraged this morning and understand that leaders who are resolute on becoming movers and shakers are those who understand that God can take the greatest disappointments and tragedies and make them a link in the chain of the fulfillment of his purposes in your life. So it doesn't matter what tragedy you have undergone. It doesn't matter what disappointment you have undergone. But God can take the, all of that and make it something that can be fruitful in his purposes for your life. I want us to understand that leaders who are determined to make a difference in the kingdom of God are those who grasp that God is present in every act and movement and in every event in our lives. And what he basically does is he takes every situation and brings it to a climax. He brings it to a place where he reveals himself to us, where he shows us that he's the one who's going to bring us to a place where we can actually move in the fullness of his purposes. And leaders who impact also recognize that God, just as he used Esther's circumstances, he can also use your very own circumstances to providently work out his divine purposes for you. How many of you believe that? Amen. So my question to you this morning is, are you going to continue? to live as a victim or are you going to take on the righteousness and salvation of Christ and live as a victim? The choice is yours. 
You can decide, you can tell yourself, you know what, I'm going to embrace, I'm just going to accept what my past, what my life has, has given me. Or are you going to be the kind of person who believes and says, you know what, I have been called for such a time as this, that this is my moment to impact in the kingdom of God, that I have been created for this season, that I've been created for this generation, that I've been created for this time and age so that I can make a difference in the kingdom of God. The choice is entirely yours. Everything can be taken away from you, including your dignity. But the power to choose the attitude you have toward unfortunate circumstances will never be taken away. It will always remain yours. It will always remain your responsibility. So many people have gone through trials in life. So many people have gone through hiccups in life. But the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, what is your attitude towards those particular circumstances? Are you the kind of person who will tell yourself that I will not allow those things to deter me from achieving the fullness of God's purpose for my life? The second quality we're going to look at is leaders who are designed for influence acknowledge the importance of the favor of God in fulfilling their assignment. It's interesting what it says in Esther 2 verse 9. Now the young woman pleased him and she obtained his favor. So he readily gave beauty preparations for her besides her allowance. Then seven choice maid servants were provided for her from the king's palace. And he moved her and her maid servants to the best place in the house of the woman. The Bible makes it clear that even though Esther was amongst a group of women who were probably just as beautiful, but what happened in this particular situation was he guy, the guy was responsible for this woman, Esther found favor in the eyes of he guy. Now, biblical favor simply means a friendly disposition from which kind acts proceed to assist, to provide special advantages, or to receive preferential treatment. That is basically what biblical favor means. And God takes whatever, God takes whatever you have. God takes your faithfulness. God takes your, your, your heart, your passion for him, for the things of, you, of his kingdom. And when he takes those things, wherever they are, whatever they are, what he does is he adds his favor. But when he adds his favor, what he does is he then begins to fit it into the greater purpose of his kingdom. And when he fits it into the greater purpose of his kingdom, what happens is he causes it to soar so that it climbs to that place where you can fulfill the purposes of God. God in his in in your life so God the the favor of God is essential for us to accomplish what he's called us to he adds it to whatever background you come from he adds it to whatever circumstances you may have gone through he adds it to even the negative things that you may have experienced in your life and then he molds it and shapes it into a place where you can actually fulfill and excel even in the most unlikely of circumstances. So basically what favor does is that it mobilizes others to help you in accomplishing God's plans for, for your life, God's plans for his kingdom. It mobilizes the favor of, of other people. Favor also positions you to influence and to bring breakthrough to what you've been called to. Favor is that which helps you to achieve God-given assignments with minimum effort. There are certain things that favor the favor of God can do that not even your natural abilities can, can do. Not even your natural gifts can do. Not even your natural talents can do. There are certain situations, there are certain breakthroughs that will only transpire when the favor of God rests on your life, when the favor of God is evident in your life. 
Favor promotes you. We see a story here of a woman who one day she's an orphaned Jew. One day she's an adopted Jew. She's a second class citizen. The next, in a, and then in about 12 months time, she becomes queen in this particular kingdom. Without favor, destiny fulfillment can suffer needless delay or abortion. Don't be fooled. If we don't have the favor of God in our lives, our, 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 we are unlikely to fully impact. We are unlikely to influence in what we've been, we've been called to. And we can bring the purposes of God to abortion, which can be quite sad. I like what it says in Psalm 5 verse 12. It says, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround them as with a shield. With favor, you will surround them as with a shield. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you in your work environment, in your families, in your businesses, in whatever domain you're in. I want to encourage you to consistently ask that the favor of God accompanies you in every situation and on a day-to-day -day basis. My question to you is, are you going Are you going to be the kind of leader who embraces the favor of God and recognizes its impact and importance in your life? The third quality we're going to look at is that leaders who are designed for influence have to undergo a period of preparation. Irrespective of what kind of a passion you have for what you may be called to, irrespective of what kind of a passion you have for, for, for God or for, for, for his purposes for your life, it tells us in Esther 2 verse 12, each young man, each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after he, she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation apportioned. Six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. We've just read that when they assembled these women, they were not ugly. They were not ugly at all. But what they were doing here was they took them through a process of preparation to make them, I don't know, more beautiful, to make them more attractive. But they were not ugly people. They were not ugly ladies. They were not unattractive. And it's interesting that they found it important to actually take them through a process and a period of preparation. And Esther's journey to influence did not happen overnight. And I believe it's the same for us. Our journey to influence in what God has called us to do will not happen overnight. God prepares us for his destiny. He refines our character through the experiences that we go through. That's just why it is important that we understand, we read, we spend time in the word. That is why it's important that we become effectively discipled so that we are prepared to actually accomplish the fullness of what God has called us to. Don't think that you can come to church to one, you know, on a Sunday and then that's it. That's all you ever need for you to move in the fullness of God. God's purpose for your life. We've got to be people, we've got to be the kind of leaders who are interested and who succumb ourselves to the process of preparation. There are things in our characters that have to be washed off, that have to be cleansed, that have to be sharpened so that we can influence out there, so that we can be effective in the kingdom of God. You may think yourself gifted, you may think yourself uh, talented, but I want to encourage you this morning to understand that we still do need a period of preparation if we are going to effectively accomplish what God has called us to. Being taken through a process of preparation presses, purges our impurities in the hearts and spirits such as pride, rebellion, selfishness and bitterness so that we can be pliable in the hands of our Lord to follow the lead to fulfill his promises. And if you notice what they would do with these ladies is that they were taken through basically two different stages of preparation. The first one, the Bible tells us that it was six months with oil of myrrh. 
And what I find interesting about this, if you go into the background, is that basically what this oil would do, it, the, actually, actually the term myrrh comes from the Hebrew word mara, which means bitterness. So it was actually a process of being soaked in this oil, and it was a bitter process. This oil was an, a unique ointment and it was used to preserve, it was also used to preserve as an embalming fluid. It was used in the making of perf perfume to preserve its fragrance. And without enduring this particular process of preparation, our fragrance would not be what it should be. So it is interesting that for six months, can you imagine, can you just picture this particular scenario where for six months you're being prepared with this particular oil which was called myrrh. And the whole idea there was to ensure that a particular fragrance would come out of you at the end of those, um, or the time, at the end of the time of preparation. The second stage of prefer preparation was with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. So what they would do during this time was that Persian women would have cosmetic burners. And in those cosmetic burners, they would put certain fragrances, certain oils, and so on. And then they would heat them. As they were heated, what would happen is that they would then, um, they, they would then uh, exude a, cert a certain scent, which would then um, basically uh, be absorbed by their bodies. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking in the very same way, we need to succumb to the preparation of the process of God in our lives. And what God does is he takes our scent. I mean, if you were to smell the next person next to you, I don't think they smell the same as you. But what God does is he takes the very things that he's put in your life, the very gifts he's put in your life, the very strengths, the very talents he's put in, in your life. And what he does is he brings the oil of the Holy Spirit so that when that, those particular strengths and gifts and talents, when they are mixed with the oil of the Holy Spirit, they exude a, cert a certain scent that is different from the scent ex exuded by the person next to you. That is why it is important for us to understand that the territories of our influence are not the same. The territories of our, of our influence are not the same. Our sphere of influence is not the same. Your life experience, your life experiences, the word that is in you, the experiences you've, you've gone with, you've undergone with God, your understanding of the things of the Holy Spirit, all those things, they actually bring a particular fragrance that is unique to what God has called you to. So when leaders understand that each exude a unique fragrance in the earth, that uniqueness can be a specific domain, that uniqueness can be a specific calling, that uniqueness can be a specific power of, um, center of influence. The fourth quality is that leaders who are designed for influence are awakened to destiny. I like what it says in Esther 3. I'm going to read from verse 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadat, and advanced him and set, him, and set his seat above the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were with the king at the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. And then if we look at verse 5, it says, When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for he had told him of the people of Mordecai, for he had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom, the people of Mordecai. In verse 8, then says, Then Haman said to the king, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of the kingdom. Their laws are different from all the other peoples, and they do not keep the king's law. Therefore, it is not befitting for the king for, to let them remain. If 
it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatum, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. So the king here issues a decree to exterminate Jews. And what's interesting here is that the moment that this decree is issued, it became a turning point in Esther's life. We pick up the story in Esther 4 verse 15. It says, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shashan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And what was basically happening here was that this was a turning point in Esther's life because the Jews were just about to be destroyed. So Esther then sends a message to all the Jews in the community and basically instructs them to fast for her so that she'll come and is prepared to actually be in the presence of, of the king and hopefully that the this particular decree would be reversed. She says, if I perish, I perish. Now that is a statement of resolve and courage. And basically what it did was it awakened in her, her purpose and destiny. I want to ask you the quest a question. In, I want to ask you this morning, have you ever come to a place where there are certain crises that awaken your purpose and your destiny? It was at this pivotal time in Esther's life that she she recognized that as queen in the Persian king's palace, unless she did something to save her people, they were going to be killed and she too was going to be killed. But not only was, it, was she going to be killed, remember up until this time, Esther has not disclosed her, her identity. Her real name wasn't even Esther. Esther was a Persian name. Her real name was Adassa. And at, at, the people, even probably including the king, wasn't even aware that she was, a, she was Jewish. And so it is at this particular time that the decision made Esther to cross the road and define and be, it became a defining moment in her life. She had to choose between revealing the Jewish roots she had successfully hid or stepping out and owning who she really was. And as I was thinking about this, I picture the, just picture this particular scenario where Esther goes into the presence of the king. And the king probably calls her, Esther, I see, you know, you're here. And then she goes, well, you know what? Don't call me Essie. My name is actually Hadassah. And the king probably going, Hada what? Who are you? All along I thought you were, you, I didn't realize you were, you were not, you were, you were a Jew. This was a moment of truth, a monumental decision. This also revealed the crossroad that all leaders must face. I don't know about you, but you've probably have gone through circumstances in your life when there's something about your Christianity that has to come out. You've probably been faced with certain challenges in the work environment where maybe certain people believe in certain things, believe in certain rituals of certain philosophers, and then you're forced to come to a place and a time where you actually have to let your Christian values come to the fore. Maybe you've been in that particular place where you've come to a place where you realize that unless you fight for the kingdom of God, you're going to be contaminated in that particular environment. My question to you is, are you the kind of leader who would respond to the call of God to do something significant in history, even if it means risking your life? And often what happens is that our destinies are shaped by our choices. There is nobody whom God created that he hasn't given a destiny or bestowed a purpose for their life. But what happens, the difference is that the extent to which you achieve that destiny is a function of your choices. 
And I want to ask you, have you made the kind of choices that propel you to the, ne to the next level of what God has called you to? Like Esther, your defining moment as a leader will, present, will represent your true self. Like Esther, you may have a defining moment that will lead you to break through in your identity. The fifth quality that we're going to look at is that leaders who are designed for influence know when to break the, con the conspiracy of silence. Leaders who are designed for influence know when to break the conspiracy of silence. Esther 4 verse 13 to 14. And Mordecai told them to answer to Esther. Do you think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, and that word that is used there for silent is actually the word to conceal. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will come from another place and you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. What does it mean to break the conspiracy of silence? When you break the conspiracy of silence, you're basically saying you're coming to that place where you stand for what you believe in, where you stand for what God has called you to, where you will move and stand in the fullness of God's purposes, even if you, you endanger your life, where you are saying against all odds, I am going to stand and speak out. Are you the kind of leader who's prepared to break the silence? Are you the kind of leader who's prepared to yield, who's pre to refuse to yield to the fear and would want, that would want to keep you silent when you should be making a stand? Ask yourself, how many times did you remain silent when you should have spoken? How many times... Did you succumb to the pressures of the people around you? Maybe it's because they didn't believe in the same things as you believed in and you chose to remain silent. The next quality we're going to look at is that leaders who are designed for influence lead and reign with the scepter of prayer and fasting. They lead and reign with the scepter of prayer and fasting. In chapter 4, Esther 4, verse 16, it says, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shashan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, but if I perish, I perish. I like what it says in Matthew 17, 21. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And what I like about what Esther says is that it basically demonstrates maturity and leadership, basically demonstrates maturity and leadership in declaring a fast. I mean, she could have made, she could have chosen to just go and stand in the presence of the king. But here, the principle that comes out here is there are certain things in the kingdom of God that are going to require for us to actually pray and to fast. Because what happens when we fast is that we are recognizing that the situation or the breakthrough that we require is actually something that we need counsel from God. We need the direction, we need the leading of God. We need the strategy of God. And in this particular situation, they needed the strategy of God to understand how the Jews were going to be delivered in this time of danger. So she commands that a fast be called and she commands that everybody, all the Jewish community, everybody within the Jewish community comes to a place of fasting and seeking God so that they would clearly hear what God had to say. She was also basically saying, guys, even if I am the one who's going to go into the presence of the king, but I'm going to need your agreement. We're going to need to be united in the spirit. There are certain things that we will not accomplish in the kingdom of God unless we are united in the spirit, unless we move in one 
oneness unless there's an understanding that unless there's the spirit of, of agreement within us it is not going to happen so fasting in this case would release the manifold wisdom of God fasting would usher them into the counsel of God I want to ask you this morning Whenever you need a breakthrough, whenever you need God to do something in your life, to what extent do you actually take time to fast and pray? For some of you, I know it's a foreign concept. For some of you, it's probably you actually need to get to a place where you begin to train yourself the culture of fasting. The seventh quality For leaders who, are leaders who are designed for influence are not afraid to rewrite the decree. They are not afraid to rewrite the decree. In Esther 8 verse 8 it says, You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. And so basically what the king said to Esther and Mordecai was, you know what? Yes, there was a decree. There has been a decree that's been issued against all the Jews in my kingdom. But I now give you permission to rewrite the decree. I now give you permission to reverse what has been put in that decree. And basically a decree is an official order. It's, an, it's, it's a decision it can ban, it can outlaw, or it can restrict. And the king asked Esther and Mordecai to rewrite it, to reverse what the enemy had decided. I want to ask you, how many things do you know that have been decreed, have been written, have been established, have been spoken by the enemy that you need to rewrite? that you need to reverse, that you need to, re to resist before you can move into the fullness of, the, of, the, of what God has called you to. If we are going to be effective leaders, if we are going to be leaders who are called to influence, to impact, to make a difference, we've got to be aware, we've got to be cognizant of the lies of the enemy that we've believed. We've got to be cognizant of that which needs to be deconstructed before we can proceed and move effectively as an army in the kingdom of God. My question to you is, do you know what that is? Sometimes what happens in our Christian walk is we move year in, year out with lies. We believe lies. We believe what the enemy has said about our lives. But here, the principle that comes out is God has enabled us. God has given us the power, the authority to rewrite and refuse those things which are not of God, which are a hindrance to, our, to us achieving the purposes of God. Decrees issue sudden breakthroughs in different situations. Decrees are the basis and foundation of your breakthrough. They release the ability to do whatever is needed to break the power of Satan in any given situation. What power of Satan has to be broken in your life? What power of Satan has to be broken in your destiny? What power of Satan has to be broken in your domain? What power of Satan has to be broken in your family? What power of Satan has to be broken in your thought patterns? What power of Satan has to be broken in your, in your attitude? I don't know what it may be. But leaders who are designed for influence are not afraid to rewrite, to reverse what, sat what Satan has decreed for our lives. My question to you is what has been decreed by the enemy in your calling that you need to reverse? What lies have you believed that need to be deconstructed? Leaders of impact are not afraid to reverse the words of the enemy. I want to ask you, are you in that place where you've been awakened to your destiny? Are you in that place where you're actually determined to break the conspiracy of silence and stand for the truth of God?
Are you in that place where you are prepared to lead and reign with a sector of prayer and fasting? Are you in that place where you are bold and willing to rewrite the decree that is not consistent with the word of God for your life? And as I conclude this morning, my final question to you is, is it that yet who knows whether you've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this? I like what it says in Psalm 139 verse 16. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God has designed and fashioned our days. Your days have been fashioned for you. God created you. The Bible tells us that even before we were formed, God had actually laid out his life. He had actually laid out our purposes for us before we were born. But we also need to understand that the devil also wants to insert his days into your book. The devil also wants to mess up the purposes, that particular life which has been fashioned for you, for God. And leaders who are designed for influence, what they do is they press in to find out what they've been called to. They know that even they cannot afford to just live a life without understanding what they've been called to. I want to encourage you this morning that every detour, every situation in your life converges into this very moment, irrespective of what's happened in your past. It's not even about the future. It's understanding that even today, you've got a place, you've got something that you call to do in the kingdom of God. We have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We have been called to display the kingdom of God in the earth. We've been called to influence the domains and the power centers in our generation, in our time, in this season. Even like Esther, your story might not be attractive, but that doesn't mean that God has forgotten about you. The tragedies, the violation, the, ve the very shame that we experience can actually be used by God to make us be people who gain territory in his kingdom. Malachi 3 verse 6 says, For I am the Lord and I do not change. God is aligning ill things by his spirit so that we can receive favor, so that we can receive boldness and courage to actually move in what he has commissioned us to do. Have you been called for such a time as this? Shall we rise to our feet?